Hi, my name is David Bodie. I'm going to talk about three more cortex-m in phonopause. So before the workshop last year, I finally managed to get Inferno running on a microcontroller fairly reliably. And when I say microcontroller, I'm talking about an STM32 microcontroller, which is a 32-bit microcontroller, and it's got a fairly luxurious amount of RAM and flash memory, and the processor is not a very slow thing. It's, it's quite a performant uh, CPU. It has 192 kilobytes of RAM and a megabyte of flash memory, and the core that runs it is a Cortex-M4 core, which has some floating point support as well. The instruction set it, it runs is the Thumb2 instruction set, which is a hybrid um, instruction set in a sense because it's designed for code density, and so some instructions are 16 bits wide and some are 32 bits wide. It's related to the original ARM instruction set, and there is some overlap with instructions, but it's a bit more complicated than that, and it probably makes writing compilers harder than it need, they need to be. This microcontroller has just about enough RAM for a tiny shell and some tiny programs, and I was using it to experiment with SPI to drive screens and flash memory. And in a sense, it, you could use it as a replacement for things like Arduino, but it's a bit higher end. Maybe it could also be used for sort of, I don't know, more higher end tasks as well. Not, not the sort of simplest microcontroller tasks, but maybe something which is between microcontrollers and regular processors. This port is a bit like the ARM ports in the Inferno tree, except it's a bit different. And one way in which it's different is the way it does task switching. So the task switching uses this approach with these two functions, set label and go to label, like many of the other ports. But the way that this is done for this port is is a bit more complicated than the regular ARM ports. And this is really because for the ARM ports they can perform tricks like changing processor modes. So when if you have a timer for example and an interrupt fires as a result of the timer, an exception is raised um, on the processor. And as a result of that, on classic arms, you would be in a particular mode. And what they t would tend to do to handle this would be to switch into a, a, a regular mode, I think supervisor mode, and then perform some task switching as normal. But in the Cortex M4 cores, it's not really possible to switch between modes in this kind of ad hoc way. And that's because Cortex-M4 cores have two processor modes, really. One is um, a, a mode for running normal code, which is a thread mode. And when exceptions occur, you have code running in handler mode. And there isn't really a way to switch between the two. Um, so you have to basically return from an exception to get back to thread mode. And this is where things are a bit different to the classic ARM ports. Because what we do here is we return into thread mode and then we run the code to sw switch the tasks. You have to be a bit careful with this. Um, I'm not sure I've really covered all the corner cases but it seems to work and it needs probably needs a, a certain amount more testing. I started writing a documentation for this that I put on GitHub and it would be good if people with expertise in that kind of uh, 
arm or thumb processor area could look at it and sort of tell me if there's anything I've really done wrong or ways in which it could be done better or made more robust. So last year I talked about frozen modules, frozen limbo modules. And this was basically a way to reduce RAM usage at runtime um, by taking disk byte code and instead of having it processed when modules are loaded and run, pre-process it at compile time, keep it in flash memory as much as possible, and yeah, basically just try and reduce the amount of effect on, on, on RAM usage, reduce the number of allocations. The so one side effect of this was it also reduced the startup RAM usage because various data structures that would otherwise be copied into RAM at startup no longer needed to be copied into RAM and so they could be kept in flash memory and this was an interesting thing for me because I hadn't really thought about just trying to reduce the overall startup cost and it made me start to think about ways to reduce RAM usage just generally. So one of the ways I looked at was one that was already in the tool chain, which was a, an option, a dash T option in TL, to allow string constants to be compiled into the text section of the binary. So I looked into this and tried it and it didn't work for some reason. And so I started to look at it in a, in a bit more detail and I found some ways to tweak it to make it do something which looked reasonable. And it turned out it had a fairly large effect on, on the RAM available. In one case that I looked at it increased it, it basically doubled the amount of available RAM. But although this sounds quite substantial, this approach overlaps with other approaches that I was taking, like the frozen module approach. And so the effect isn't typically as large as that, but it's still significant. And the other side of this is it also really complements the frozen module approach because this basically just reduces the startup RAM cost, whereas the frozen module approach isn't made redundant by this because it st that still reduces the runtime RAM cost, it reduces the number of allocations. Another approach about saving memory, it's not really so much saving memory so, uh, per se, but it's it was an experiment to just n reduce the number of memory pools in use. So there are three memory pools usually in play, uh, main, heap and image. For our purposes image is not really very useful because we're not using a display. And usually what has, has to happen is we decide in advance, uh, well at compile time, what the proportions of, um, what the memory proportions are for the main and heap pools. And this is fine for large systems, but for, for systems with a, not very much RAM that can cause problems um, because you could run out of one or the other of those uh, pools fairly easily even though there's still free memory in the system. And in this case if we just use one, if we basically alias the heap and heap pool to the main pool um, we just have one pool and all the allocations come from that. I'm not really sure how safe this is. Uh, I realize that you really need to kind of make sure that the main pool doesn't run out of memory. So I suppose there's the danger that certain things that would normally use the heat pool could exhaust the main pool, but it at least allows some things to run on smaller systems that would otherwise be not possible. 
Another uh, memory saving um, approach that I briefly looked at was finding constant structures or immutable structures and moving them into the text section as well. And I had some difficulty with this because uh, it's not very easy for me to see how to do that with the tool chain. I spent some time looking at the compiler and the, the linker loader just to kind of see where information gets propagated and if I could pull things out at certain times like the string constants are. So in the end I just resorted to a quick hack to check symbol names for things which I knew were uh, read-only. And it turned out that if I move some things like lookup tables into the uh, text section, it saved a few kilobytes more. So it may or may not be worth it, but it's useful to look at this a bit more. Really because things add up um, and for small systems that's quite useful. So another area that I was looking at was just updating the tool, tool chain for things like floating point instructions. So Cortex M4 cores have, um, I would say, modern ARM instructions for floating point. Um, that unfortunately, they're typically just single precision, and Inferno uses double precision. So the question is how useful they are. Um, it turns out that some of them sort of overlap, so moving um, doubles into, in, into and out of memory, uh, uh, you can have instructions for this sort of thing, even, even if double precision arithmetic isn't supported. In any case, I borrowed a lot of code from 5L, moving it into TL, and I had to convert what it generated to a uh, thumb2 representation. Uh, I mean, really, I, th I think with this, you're just swapping around 16 bits, the first and last 16 bits of, of a 32-bit instruction, which is not particularly helpful. Um, the way I did it was arguably not the best, and it could be made a lot closer to 5L. There, was, uh, there were a couple of other issues. One of them was to do with converting double to long, where the endianness for the doubles was somehow different for thumb too. And the, I think there was also a case where there was a missing definition for a temporary floating point register, although I may have removed that. Also, what I had to do was disable registerization in libmath to avoid a, a compiler issue. Um, and this may be also a problem that faces other ports as well. And with floating point instructions, the other area we have to look at is how to implement or how to handle unimplemented floating point instructions. So for many of these Cortex, M4 cores, they only support single precision instructions, even though there is an overlap with double precision for certain operations. So there needs to be code to handle undefined instructions. And this, is, this was done by basically taking the existing ARM implementation and creating a variant for, for thumb instructions and since they share the instructions more or less this was quite straightforward and then it was a case of testing that they did what they were supposed to do so I created a simple test program to perform various different kinds of instructions and I also yeah basically created more decorative and frivolous tests for this as well. And there are some notes and commentary about the way I handled this uh, on the site that I, I mentioned before where I'm trying to document parts of the implementation of these ports.
and also in the the diary that I keep for things that I do with Inferno. So about these new ports of Inferno to microcontrollers. All of them are ports to spark from micromod boards, uh, but they could be easily adapted to other similar boards. It's just that it was convenient to use the micromod system for this because the processor boards and the carrier boards are interchangeable. So the, the first one I looked at after the STM32 was the um, Atmel SAMD51 and this has 256 kilobytes of RAM which is arguably a better starting point for porting Inferno. I didn't get into porting Inferno to this very well when I started and ended up going off and looking at the STM32 instead because I found it a bit daunting. But once I'd done the STM32 port I, I realised that this one wasn't quite as frightening as I thought it was. So actually getting it to work was a lot quicker than I imagined. The next one is the Artemis module which has an Apollo 3 core from Ambic and that has 384 kilobytes of RAM which is quite a bit to play with in many respects. It gives you a bit of freedom to experiment. It has a Bluetooth module and um, I haven't really figured that out yet. I've been looking at code in the Arduino uh, libraries and framework because they have examples for how to try and do various tasks with Bluetooth. Uh, the Teensy is, a, is actually a bit more, a, a bit of a bigger um, CPU as an IMAX. Uh, CPU which is actually more like an SOC and it's a Cortex M7 um, core which is somewhat higher level than the M4 cores that I've looked at. It has a megabyte of RAM which is pretty useful, gives you room to stretch your legs and double precision floating point support which actually means you don't really have to do any anything at all with emulating undefined instructions. Some issues remain with all of these. Um, the Teensy um, has some issue, I think, occasionally with lock loops. Uh, so I need to really look into that a bit more. And um, the SAMD51 probably has issues but I can't really investigate those anymore because the board I, I was using uh, stopped working. I've tried to document as much as I can of the way the implementation works for all of these and um, yeah I've provided um, links to all of these ports in the documentation that I've been writing. So alongside porting to these other microcontrollers I've also been looking at the different peripherals, the different hardware buses and things like that that each of them supports. The first port, the STM32, um, obviously has some support for things like the UART and status LED. I got into doing things with I2C and uh, SPI, so external flash memory and doing things with e-paper. I didn't really do very much with the SAMD51. Um, UART and LED were basically there at startup just to test it. I was doing things with USB and then managed to cause the thing to fail, possibly. The Apollo 3 on the Artemis module, um, again, the usual things to get going with, and uh, I then started bringing across support from the STM32 to do similar things, uh, except I, I also looked at uh, an LCD screen as well. I haven't really done as much with the Teensy. Um, I think that is more of a platform for potentially messing around with the just-in-time compiler, given that it has a lot more memory to play with. I did initially start looking at the just-in-time compiler on the Apollo 3, but I'm not sure I had enough memory to play with there. And the implementations of 
how these devices and hard, how this hardware is handled can be quite similar between the different uh, peripherals and the different on the different ports. And so, yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting to play with bits of hardware here. Um, a lot of this is handled with yeah file systems and. Um, there are existing file systems you can just use um, for things like I2C, also I think SPI, but for, for many of these things where you have a screen, it's quite interesting to think about creating a file system where you expose, let's say, a data file that you just write to and maybe have some sort of higher level code to actually send the data to the device. Um, instead of exposing the SPR interface directly, um, it's arguably more rewarding to do things with things like ePaper, uh, especially with the devices like the um, the, the Artemis module, because that's supposed to be quite a low-power device, and so it makes you consider applications where you could build solutions which were a very low power. With three new ports, there's a, a certain amount of duplicated code between them. This is because when I create a new port, I typically take one that already works and remove board specific files from it, just keeping the core files and the build files, and just try and get it to work. But this means that there's, there are common files to all of them, or there were common files to all of them, and a, a fair amount of common code. And what I wanted to do was really just tidy that up and have a, a common place for all the, for example, Thumb or Cortex-M code that they could all share, and so they wouldn't have to have individual copies. So I created a Cortex-M branch for this, and I put common code in a Cortex M directory, like the historical SA1110 directory for all those different boards and devices that had strong arms in them. The SAMD51 port is still separate because the board that I have no longer works and I don't really have much desire to revisit that at the moment. At some point if I get another board which is compatible I, I may merge it in with the others. But you can check out the Cortex-M branch to, to see what I've done and hopefully this will make porting new boards or uh, porting Inferno to new boards that are related to these slightly easier th than it would have been. So what's next? Well the first thing I'd like to do is measure the sizes of read-only and writable data structures. This should help me figure out how much more memory I can save and how much more RAM I can play with on various microcontrollers. So this means basically looking at ways to keep read-only data in flash memory. One of the other things I'd like to look at is to make the task switching a bit more robust. I'm fairly happy with it at the moment, but I have begun to realize there are things I haven't considered. So there are some things I need to look at and I shall be looking at some of the other ports to see what they do in certain situations. Try and make sure that I've implemented all the things that I should have done. So we'll see if that breaks things and if I have to rethink how I've implemented it. Another thing I really want to do is to document how things were implemented for these ports a bit more than I already have done. I've started to do this with the collection of documents that I've put up on GitHub for things like floating point support and for task switching, but I really want to kind of broaden this out a bit to have much more information for people who want to try and do similar things. And I'd like to look at possibly doing some more ports to other related 
microcontrollers. It would be interesting to also to consider other architectures as well, but that really depends on compiler support. I know that there is some RISC, RISC V support, some uh, there's a tool chain for that, and it would maybe be interesting to look at the uh, extensor architecture as well on the ESP32 uh, processors. Finally, there are some resources that you can look at. Uh, there's a related paper for these slides, um, which contains a bit more information, especially about memory usage. I created a site which I called Inferno Ports. It's just a, a GitHub site, really, that contains a list of different ports that not just the ones I've worked on, but also the general Raspberry Pi port. Uh, it contains links to, to them, links to the instructions for building them, and also in some cases uh, links to um, downloadable files to actually install on them. And there's a related Inferno Ports documentation site which tries to cover the implementation of well, especially these Cortex-M4 and M7 ports. I also have a diary which I update from time to time to help keep me going with Inferno. And uh, I, I've talked about some of the issues that I've mentioned here in that. And there is also my presentation from last year, which gives a bit more background information on the work that I did with freezing limbo modules. Thanks very much for listening.